What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi bringing you another video discussing the spectrum of mood disorders. So today's video is going to be an exciting one because it's going to further elaborate on the topics I covered last week in the previous video where I talked a little bit about different categories of depression and I focused on one in particular. I focused on those mixed episodes of depression and we're going to really elaborate on that here today and we're going to try to understand why separating mood disorders into distinct categories such as major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder doesn't make a whole lot of sense scientifically. Now if you've worked in psychiatry as long as I have, then what you know is you've encountered these patients all the time. And what kind of patients am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about individuals who do not fit one diagnostic category perfectly. They don't quite fit major depressive disorder, they don't quite fit into the bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 category. So you don't know what to do with them because they don't fit neatly into what DSM-5 tells us should be the standard diagnosis. Now, some data suggests that up to 50% of people who present with depressive episodes actually are have between one and three manic symptoms present during these depressive episodes. And as I keep saying, manic symptoms always matter. So what this creates is a difficulty for us because we have to determine how bipolar is the person sitting across from us? Is this somebody that is, you know, pure, again, pure depression or melancholic depression versus is this somebody who is experiencing a mixed depressive episode? So we have to determine how bipolar the person is sitting across from us because it's very much going to influence our treatment decisions. So for these individuals, we might be thinking, is this a person we would want to start antidepressants on or not? Is this a person that we would prefer to start something like lamotrigine, low-dose lithium, or a dopamine-blocking medication instead of an SSRI, which could be mood destabilizing for individuals that we suspect have mixed depressive episodes? So the goal of today's discussion is to provide a dimensional approach instead of a categorical approach to mood disorders. So we're going to look at the so-called mood spectrum, and we're going to try to see what separates these things and why a spectrum makes more sense than pure categorical diagnosis. An argument can be made that a large proportion of depressive episodes that we see clinically are mixed in nature, meaning that there is some combination of manic and depressive symptoms present at the same time. Now, if we go back to a Kreplinian approach to disease and say manic depressive illness, for example, he did not specify polarity when he created this diagnosis. And I think rightfully so. So for example, an individual can have 100 episodes of depression and still have manic depressive illness. They could also likewise have 10 manic episodes and still have manic depressive illness. So again, in the Kreplinian manic depressive illness approach to things, there is no polarity specified. What was important in these cases is that the symptoms were happening at all, right? The depressive and the depressive symptoms as well as the manic symptoms were present at all, and that they recurred in an episodic fashion. That was the important point. It was the course of illness that really helped us to understand why this was a disease and not just, you know, situational problem, let's say, for example. So the, you might be thinking at this point that this is definitely going against conventional wisdom in psychiatry and you'd be right, so you should stay tuned for the next sections to learn more about why this line of thinking makes more sense. So you might be thinking there's already a mixed episode specifier in the DSM-5 for people who have depression with mixed features. The issue here is that when DSM came up with this idea, they wanted to keep those with mixed features completely separate from those without mixed features. So they wanted you to be able to separate a mixed depression from a non-mixed de depression very clearly. And as a result, they excluded some of the key or core symptoms of mixed depressive episodes. So they got rid of things that were essential to making this diagnosis because they didn't want any overlap between the mixed and non-mixed episodes. So namely things like irritability and agitation were excluded from the DSM-5 criteria because again, it could happen in both regular depression or non-mixed depression and mixed depression. So that's what ended up being published. And essentially in order to meet the criteria as defined by DSM-5, you would have to have, you'd have to meet full criteria for a major depressive episode and you would have to have at least three manic symptoms. And those manic symptoms would be 
very similar or actually the same basically as those specified in the bipolar criteria. So distractibility, indiscretions, grandiosity, talkativeness, etc., etc., right? So the person would have to have those features to meet criteria as defined by DSM. However, the core symptoms, like I said, and the key characteristics of mixed depressive episodes are excluded. Things like agitation, things like distractibility, irritability, indecisiveness, and insomnia. All of those things were excluded, again, because they would allow for overlap between a non-mixed and mixed episode. This would be like excluding auditory hallucinations from the diagnosis of schizophrenia because auditory hallucinations could also potentially occur in other disorders like bipolar mania, for example, or major depressive disorder with psychotic features. So as you can see, it doesn't make much sense to exclude these core symptoms because they are defining and characteristic features of a mixed depressive episode. So in 2022, the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists published clinical guidelines that advocate for a mood spectrum category. This spectrum will include everything from bipolar disorder on one end to unipolar depression on the other end and everything in between. So this is a major shift in thinking from what we've previously seen in psychiatry as a whole. Now at the bipolar end of the spectrum, we can all agree that antidepressants are largely ineffective and probably are harmful. They probably do more harm than good for those individuals. However, at the unipolar end of the spectrum, antidepressants are routinely prescribed. And in the previous video, we discussed, you know, which forms of depression would potentially be ideal for medication and which would respond better to other therapies, such as psychotherapy, for example. This leaves us with the question of what do we do about the large proportion of patients who are going to fall into that middle category? They're not going to quite fit unipolar or major depression. They're not going to quite fit bipolar disorder. So there are no current guidelines to help guide us on the treatment of these individuals in the middle ground because it's largely been unrecognized as a, legitimate, as a legitimate category for disease. From the research that I've been able to see, there's a couple of choices that we have here. If you believe the patient is somewhere in the middle or is a mixed depressive episode, doesn't quite fit the categories, but leans more towards having some manic symptoms along with their depression, then these individuals tend to respond better to mood stabilizing medications such as lamotrigine or lithium, as well as the dopamine blocking medication, specifically trying to choose those like suprazidone, for example, that may have a lower risk of metabolic side effects. Now, again, there's not a whole lot of data to say that that's going to be the exact right choice or be the thing that's going to help the most. So you may want to start with lamotrigine and lithium first and then see if you need to modify anything or change anything as the patient progresses. Now, of course, on the pure unipolar end of the spectrum, SSRIs are a staple and do provide some benefit. However, there is risk for weight gain, sexual dysfunction, and the potential for a very severe withdrawal syndrome when those individuals try to get off the medication. Now, if a person falls into the middle category of the spectrum and you prescribe lamotrigine, your risk of causing Steven Johnson syndrome is about 1 in 2,000, which is substantially less than the risk of causing, say, withdrawal symptoms from somebody who is taking an SRI, for example. So you also have the added benefit of saying, if I believe this person falls more into the mixed criteria or is somewhere in the middle between bipolar and unipolar, that I don't run the risk of starting antidepressants on them and causing rapid cycling, mixed mood states, and or treatment resistance. So there's high risk. For causing more harm than good in those individuals. So again, your decision making should be to start a medication like lamotrigine or low dose lithium, for example, to avoid those problems such as rapid cycling, mixed states, and treatment resistance as mentioned above. And also with those individuals, let's say you do start that serotonin medication knowing those risks, you also have the risk for weight gain, sexual dysfunction, and of course withdrawal syndrome from these medications on top of the risk for rapid cycling and other problems. All right guys, so I'm gonna hold the video there on the mood spectrum. I think this is a really important video because it's a huge shift in the way that we've been thinking as psychiatrists and mental health professionals for a long time. Everybody wants to fit people into neat DSM-5 categories of unipolar depression or bipolar depression. And what we find clinically, and I found this 
throughout my career, throughout my training, that a lot of times patients don't fit neatly into these boxes and it's very hard to make a decision then about what you should do from a treatment perspective. Because you have to remember when you're guided by studies, research studies, they select people who have pure unipolar depression or pure bipolar depression. So if you're choosing a medication based on that, and you're seeing somebody who doesn't fit that category perfectly or who might be using substances or other things or have other psychosocial factors, they may not respond to the treatment the way you would expect them to. But let's just say for the sake of argument that we're having trouble because we're identifying a lot of people who fall into this middle category. They might have depression with mixed features, for example. They might have a few manic symptoms. They might only have one manic symptom. However, this should be changing our thinking in terms of medication management because we could potentially do more harm than good if we prescribe this individual an antidepressant. Anybody that falls into this bipolar spectrum and falls again more towards the bipolar end of the mood disorder spectrum, they are at risk for rapid cycling, mood destabilization, they're at risk for treatment resistance as well when they're prescribed antidepressants. So we want to be mindful that antidepressant prescribing is dangerous in these individuals and can cause a lot of mood symptoms, but it can also have the risks of weight gain, sexual side effects, and withdrawal syndrome, all of which are bad. So not only are there the classic problems and side effects we have with antidepressant medications, but you also have this risk of worsening their mood. Now, if we are identifying these individuals, we should be thinking first about our mood stabilizing agents like Lamotrigine and low dose lithium. And we can also be thinking about the dopamine blocking medications, specifically trying to choose medications that have a lower metabolic side effect profile, as that is the biggest risk with those medications. Although mixed depressive episodes respond very well to medications such as lorazidone or quetiapine, for example. So with that said, I'm gonna stop it there. Make sure you like the video, make sure you subscribe to the channel, and also drop your comments below. I would love to see your guys' thoughts on, these, on this new content.